Good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, uh, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. Uh, my name is Peter Murray, and I'm the open source community advocate at Index Data and the host for today's event. Uh, our topics today is the Folio Codex, the core metadata at the heart of the Folio platform. Today's session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. As an open forum, uh, participants can see each other in the attendee list and in the question box. Uh, and we've muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. Uh, I encourage you to use the question box within Zoom uh, to enter questions and comments as they come to you. Uh, using that uh, question and answer box uh, allows us to uh, uh, manage uh, the questions effectively. Uh, also, please indicate uh, in your question whether you have a microphone and can ask your question directly to the panelists. Uh, if so, I'll uh, promote you to a panelist and, and uh, you can uh, use your microphone to ask your question. Uh, if not, I'll be happy to ask your question on your behalf. Uh, the panelists will address the questions at the end of our introductory presentations. Uh, if you like to tweet, uh, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to uh, continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio Discussion website, uh, discuss.folio.org. Our panelists today are Kristen Wilson and Lynn Wittenberg, uh, both from North Carolina State University, Vince Barrow from EBSCO, Sebastian Hammer from Index Data, and Ian Ibbotson, sorry, uh, from Knowledge Integrated. Uh, we're starting today with a Folio Codex introduction by Kristen Wilson. Uh, Kristen, take it away. Thanks, Peter. Can everyone see these slides? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, yep, so as Peter said, I'm going to be doing a very brief, probably about 10, maybe a little longer minutes, um, high level introduction to the Folio Codex. And the goal of this is to really just kind of introduce the concepts behind the codex, why we're using this model, and a little bit about how it's going to work. And then Lynn will be talking in more detail about the implementation pro process and some of the decisions that are being made. So I'm going to start out with this slide um, that talks a little bit about what makes Folio modern. And I'd say modern is probably one of the words that we use the most when talking about Folio. And I do think it's a good one. And I think it's a good introduction because I think there's a lot about the philosophy behind Folio that really ties well into the Codex conversation. Uh, so the first thing about Folio is that it's an open platform and it's really being designed so that people can contribute to the project, whether it's ideas, whether it's developing applications, whether it's contributing data. And the codex, the way that this model is being developed, it creates kind of a neutral central data store that should make it easier for people to participate with this kind of engagement. Uh, Folio, uh, we've also really taken a focus on resource management as a core part of Folio. And so it's not even e-resource management, and it's definitely not just print resource management, but it's the idea that Folio should be able to support all types of resources that libraries manage in a pretty much equal way. And the, the codex you'll see also kind of supports that premise by allowing us to support a lot of different resource types and different sources of metadata. And then finally, Folio is one of the first, if not the first, library system that's really being built from the ground up in a world where BibFrame and linked data are on the table and are starting to be really heavily discussed. 
And um, it's probably unlikely that we'll have any kind of linked data in V1 of folio, but the codex really sets us up nicely to be able to evolve alongside bib frame and linked data and to be able to be agile enough to adapt to those new standards as they start to become more practical. So now I'll jump into talking a little bit about the data model and how the folio codex fits into that. So this blue box in the center here represents the codex. And um, at the most basic definition, the codex is kind of a very simplified record that describes a resource probably at the level of, you know, somebody who sees this could understand what this resource is. And within that codex, we do have kind of a Ferber-ish hierarchy where we've got work instance and holdings kind of dividing uh, metadata up at different levels. The other thing that's represented here are these green boxes on the outside. And those are data sources that are going to be feeding into the codex. And that's another really key component of how the codex will work. And so um, the use of knowledge bases has been a key part of our discussion, uh, being able to bring in data from external knowledge bases, like e-resource knowledge bases um, for electronic resources, perhaps things like a storage facility for a physical resource, and that would feed into the codex. And then also being able to feed in um, ILS, more traditional catalog type mark records. And so um, we, and I'll talk more about this, but we've kind of got a couple different concepts. One of them is the idea that, especially with the knowledge base concept, we may be able to do some kind of referential linking out to master records um, and then keep the codex up to date that way, but also be able to support more traditional operations of importing records into the system. And then again, keeping pace with these bib frame principles, developing in this way that this in a way that it can adapt to new technologies as they become available. Uh, so now I'll get into a little bit more detailed definition of exactly what the codex record is. And so uh, we've defined this as a normalized format agnostic record that contains key resource metadata. And so by normalized, we just mean that um, there's kind of a standard format for the codex. All metadata will get transformed into that format. Format agnostic in this case actually doesn't refer to the format of the resources themselves, but it refers to the format of the metadata. So this idea that there's external data sources coming in and feeding the codex, and those can be in almost any format and still be mapped to the codex. Um, and then the codex contains key resource data, and so it's a very simplified record. And the idea behind that is that for non-cataloging workflows, so when you're doing, you know, it's pretty simple actions like paying an invoice or circulating a book, you don't necessarily need that full rich metadata of, say, a MARC record to perform those types of workflows. And so while Folio will, of course, still have a cataloging module where all that metadata lives and can support discovery, for other workflows, this simplified record is probably enough. Um, for each um, codex record, source data will be mapped into the codex record from whatever source it's coming from. And um, we'll probably have a set of standard mappings for the most common metadata types, and then custom mappings can be developed as well, um, either for people who want to deviate from the standard or to accommodate uh, types of metadata that are maybe less common. And then the type of data that will be on the codex record, again, it's uh, kind of the basics, uh, things like resource name, identifiers, resource types, basically metadata that helps you understand what this thing is. And exactly what metadata will be on the codex record is the, the type of thing that the implementation group is working on now and that we'll probably hear a little bit more about. Uh, so where exactly do codex records come from? And there's three possibilities here. The first one is that they can be created by hand in Folio if there's ever a need to do that. Um, that would be very simple. Uh, but we don't really see that as being the primary use case. Uh, the next two are really how we envision most of the codex records being created. Um, the first 
the first method is that they can be distilled from a record that is imported into Folio. So um, for an example, we can say that you have a MARC record. So say you go out to OCLC, you download a MARC record, and then you import it into Folio. So that full record actually lives in your Folio cataloging module. But then Folio will create a codex record as kind of a layer on top of that, and it will pull out those key pieces of metadata into the codex record itself. And that provides that simplified version that can then be used by other parts of the system. If we're talking about external knowledge bases, then we can get into the referential access use case. And this is where rather than download that record and import the full record into Folio, we allow that record to just continue living in its external data source. And instead we create a referential link between Folio and the external record um, that lets us know we're talking about the same thing. And then using APIs, Folio can pull in those pieces of metadata that are used to create the codex. So in that case, actually only the codex record may live in Folio and much of the other metadata may live in an external system. And some of the potential systems that we see working with Folio here are things like um, union catalogs or national catalogs, um, perhaps OCLC if they are interested in working with us, um, vendor products, vendor databases, electronic resources, knowledge bases, and it could even be things like IRs or a storage facility that a library works with, really any external knowledge base where the person who controls that knowledge base is, is interested in interacting with Folio, we could probably support that use case. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the local versus external record concepts and how we see those um, being edited and interacted with within Folio. Um, so for the codex records where there's an attached source record, so that's a, the example where say a MARC record is actually downloaded into the system. Um, that's a pretty simple use case, pretty similar to current practices where the editing would just be done within Folio, say within a Folio cataloging module, and then changes kind of flow into the codex record. Uh, for external use cases, um, there's kind of two different scenarios. So one is that if you have a knowledge base that supports editing of your master record, um, you could, of course, just edit it in the external knowledge base, and then there would be some sort of data flow back into Folio. Um, but we've also talked about the possibility of being able to actually edit those records within Folio and then use APIs to push those changes back out to the external application as well. And that would be a way to cut down on the number of places where people need to do their work. Uh, if the external knowledge base doesn't support master record editing, then we have a couple options as well. Um, one is the idea of creating custom overlays that would allow you to basically create a custom value for a field within Folio, but it wouldn't actually change anything in that underlying KB data. So it'd be very local. Um, and then another um, kind of basic idea is to provide a way that people could actually report problems back to whoever maintains the external knowledge base in hopes that they would actually change the master record itself. So um, it definitely leads to a little bit of a different way of thinking about editing codex records in Folio, um, but I think there are a lot of possibilities to try to make that process as easy as possible. And then I'll just wrap up with a couple uh, sample workflows that show a little bit of how this data might actually flow through the system and what it may look like to work with it. So um, in this workflow, um, you could see we're starting with a record in a particular format, and there's a bunch of examples here that are all descriptive formats, but it could even be you know, a proprietary format like a vendor knowledge base as well. And so that record is either imported or um, a link is established with Folio. The data is pulled in and converted into the codex record, and it can be kind of slotted into the right level in that codex hierarchy to describe um, you know, the correct version of the resource. And then the codex record is used within the rest of the Folio system. So it could be for um, traditional functionality like discovery, circulation, acquisitions, um, but then also may be able to be pulled into different types of apps as well. So you've got things here like reading lists, learning management systems, things that might be not be part of a traditional ILS, but that could end up being part of Folio. 
Um, and then this is just another prototype workflow that shows uh, what it might look like to search for a resource resource within Folio. And this is kind of uh, intended to be a staff view. So um, and you can see in this example, somebody has pulled up a record for a book called Academic Search Engines. Um, at the, the top level is kind of some instance level metadata. And this example does uh, kind of roll up electronic and print together as well. So you can see there's a, a resource type, a couple different ISBNs, a publication date. Um, and then below that, you've got your holding level metadata that's also part of the codex. And this is where you have information like your location, your call number, status for physical items and for electronic. You would have links out to those resources. You may have information about the package it's in or the vendor who provides that resource. Um, and this is also a good example of how this uh, codex metadata is a mix of local and potentially external information. And so some of these things like the publication dates, the ISBNs, maybe even the packages that it's a part of could come from those external KBs, while things like your charge status, is this checked in or not, that's actually you know, local information for your institution within Folio. And so this display kind of brings that together and shows you how the system might look. And so um, this is all kind of the, the concepts behind the codex. And there's a lot of next steps that are being worked on to actually make this a reality. And so these are the types of things that Lynn is going to be delving into a little bit and showing how we're starting to make some of these decisions about the codex. Uh, so that's it for me. And at this point, I will turn it over to Lynn. And she will talk a little bit more about our codex implementation work. And Thanks, I Kristen. need to stop sharing. Am I still sharing? Sorry about this. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. It, let me see. I'm going to. Uh, I can't I think, get that like. Um, I think I, I have the option to share a screen. And I think it's okay. going to force yours to stop. So let's see how that. Goes. Yeah, I can't get like that bottom menu to come back out there. There we okay. go. Thanks, yep. People seeing my my screen, the codex data objects and metadata fields slide. Yes, we are. Excellent. Yep. Oh, good. All right. Um, so my. Uh, Thanks, Kristen, for doing that introduction. I think people will hear a, a few things she's already mentioned reiterated by me, but maybe in a, in a little bit different frame. Um, again, I'm Lynn Wittenberger, also from North Carolina State University Libraries, and I'm, I roped Vince Barreau, who is actually the data object, the developer of the data objects, and the, he's been working with the metadata management SIG and the Folio Codex uh, working group to sort of flesh out the metadata fields. But I, I roped him in as sort of co-presenter uh, to help me out in case I misstate anything, which hopefully I won't, but I make no guarantees. Um, so we're taking a look here at sort of an overview model of where the codex lives sort of in the ecosystem, at least of a portion of fo folio apps or mini APIs. Um, and the, co the folio is, is envisioned as a, set of mini APIs where different domains specialize in specific parts of the system. For example, inventory, as you see on the right, the knowledge base, as Kristen discussed on the left, there's acquisition, circulation, all those kinds of things. And the codex is intended to be a, a normalization or virtualization layer that allows Folio to integrate metadata from ver about various resources, regardless of their format, their encoding, or their storage location. It's intended that the codex met metadata represent the subset of metadata elements that describe resources that all the folio apps and many APIs need to understand and interact with. The immediate aim of our work was to provide folio app developers with a data structure and a set of data points, the metadata, that they can use to begin building apps and APIs around. It's expected that the data objects and their metadata will be refined as we progress through development, as use cases are run through the model and edge cases are run through the model. Uh, we expect there will be changes and refinements as we go on. So the codex is a space where library resources, regardless of their acquisition method or location, can be discovered and managed by library staff. 
And it's the staff focus of the tool that is important because that allowed us to, in our conversations, to sort of set aside the questions about patron-facing discovery, indexing, display, all that is set aside. And this is really about how the codex, what is needed in the codex to allow library staff to do their work. Um, and so Kristen did cover this a little bit, but I will um, sort of reiterate that there's two main data sources for the codex and inventory, which is um, can be comprised of records that are derived from external sources, for example, OCLC and institutional repository and copied into the local folio inventory. And they can also be created locally, uh, as Kristen mentioned, if you have a need to create a local codex record type record. There is an external KBs can also be sources of data um, where the codex record would be derived from the knowledge base, but the actual source record would remain external to folio. A workflow example for this might be um, if we look down at the bottom, there's acquisitions. If an order record is created in acquisitions, that would generate um, some type of um, instance and item record in the inventory, which in turn would populate into the codex. On the um, external database side, if it's a knowledge base, if we purchase an ebook package, for example, and activate the holdings and an external knowledge base, the codex would probably we envision through the use of an API, um, query the knowledge base and then generate instance records perhaps uh, for the pack for both the package level for the whole ebook package and for each individual item within that package. So this these are the seven el elements we're currently considering as part of the codex data objects. You'll see that we have work and subject are in blue and that's because we are not going we didn't discuss those in depth for version one of the codex. We recognize that they'll need to be discussed and fleshed out and it's intent there. The thought behind them is that there'll be data objects that can link together or connect instances. But for the purposes of version one development, we focused on the five packages you see sort of in a gold brown and I'll discuss them briefly and then we'll go into a little more depth of what metadata is in each one. So an instance is intended to describe the resource. Uh, in, generally, it contains elements of the BibFrame work, title, author, and BibFrame instance, publisher, place, of, uh, date of publication, format of the item. The other um, sort of bigger level uh, data object is something that is, does not exist in BibFrame and what we've called package. And package is used to be or, or intended to be used as a sort of a general container allowing an institution to create groups or sets of instances and or items ho or and holding item holdings as needed. Um, this could be, for example, uh, the ebook package name could be the package and then the individual titles in the package would be instances that link to that package or it could be, say, a monographic um, series where each title in the series is cataloged as its own instance level, instance and item, but they're all connected under that series title in the package. Another example that Vince brought up that I hadn't even thought about was a bound with volume, where the bound with volume would be the package and then the individual titles that are bound together would be instances in that package. Uh, the item holding, and here there, we use the term holding to mean something that the library holds, not in the mark holding sense. So uh, just to kind of, there's a little language confusion there, but, but that's the, the intent. Um, and this includes elements of bib frame item, such as location, shelf mark, barcode, and subscription type information such as coverage. And then we get to location, which is pretty much what you think it is, um, the location of the item. And coverage, which here is actually the mark sort of holdings sense of coverage. And this can be used for serials or monographs. So diving down into looking at instance metadata more closely, um, we see in generally I've used the convention that system generated fields would, are in this sort of blue. 
Um, so you'll see that instance ID and source ID would be system generated and the other fields would be mapped from the source record. The source ID, it would be the link back to the source record. It could be either in the inventory, the internal folio inventory or the external knowledge base. And because the instance is linked to the source, this allows us to pull more descriptive data from the source record on the fly for the staff search display. So the goal of the codex is not to recreate an entire descriptive record in its entirety, but to really, as Kristen mentioned, pull out the basic element set needed to support staff work. Um, so creator and contributors, a lot of these fields you'll see very similar to sort of your Dublin core metadata, creator, contributor, date, format, um, format and type, which is down at the bottom, have been discussed in a little more detail by the resource management SIG, but the intent of those is to sort of identify the sort of the physical or virtual formats to allow for staff searching, sorting, um, faceting. So this would be things like audio, video, CD-ROM, um, you know, audio cassette, those types of things would be in the format and the type containers. Um, identifiers, you see we have a call out here that these are, um, it's an extendable, extensible value pairs. So these, the types and the value, the types can be set by the institution just depending on how grant, how many layers of identifiers they need depending on their, um, on the source record. So these, uh, the example you see type ISSN and its value. Um, Vince and I even discussed it there's a possibility we could do type as a call LC call num call num classification number, sorry, not call number, classification number and the value of the classification number. Um, language, publisher, version is intended sort of the monographic, the equivalent in monographs would be addition, uh, title and type for our instance. Then package metadata. Again, as I mentioned, these are intended to be sort of a general uh, multi-purpose container to collect items and instances of various types and formats together, depending on, on whatever the need might be to do so. Um, so you have your system generated ID numbers, coverage, um, that's just a call out. There is a, a metadata, it's a data object that I will be um, delving into in a bit, in a little bit. Is, the purple. Description is a free text field for just general information describing the package. Um, is selected, I'm actually going to turn this over to Vince because he has a better explanation than I do. So Vince, if you want to pick it up from here. Sure, yeah, I'll say a couple words. The, the, the is selected is there um, mostly for the case of referential cataloging where you will have the, the source of truth be external to the system and you will make those uh, those decisions as to whether you hold something uh, in the external system. And this is simply a way to represent within Folio whether something has been selected or not. In this case, it's selection at the package level. Thanks, Vince. Um, and then items, this would be a list of the items um, associated with the package. Um, item count, system generated, just so there's sort of a statistic generated of how many items are in that package, the name of the package, the platform. The selected count um, would be used, again, it's system generated to show that the number of items within a particular package that the library either owns or subscribes to. So, so sort of to allow for a quick way, if, if a library hasn't purchased everything or subscribed to everything in an entire package, how many titles out or items out of that package the library is subscribing to. And um, vendor and then type, because this is, sort of there is no prescription on what a package has to describe. Um, type is a, another sort of uh, way or text field to help identify what kind of package we're talking about. So this could be, we might have language in here like book type is book series or type is DVD box set, type is archival container. That kind of information would belong in the type field. Item and holding metadata, um, again, uh, fields you would probably expect to see, item ID, barcode, copy number, although there is some discussion about, has been some discussion about whether that 
kind of information is still needed. Coverage um, description for items is a free form text field just to drill down to any kind of copy specific notes you might have, such as signed by author or cover damaged, that kind of thing. Um, and then I'm turning it back to Vince for talk about the is customized field a bit. Sure. Uh, so is customized is a, is a flag to indicate the state of the fields that you're seeing on the left hand side here. These are, these are fields which obviously you, you expect to find at the item level to describe the item to some extent. And you recognize that these are essentially the same fields that you saw in the instance a minute ago. And in fact, they are exactly those fields. These are, these are being inherited from the instance that the item is connected to, uh, is customized, is here to give the ability at the item level to override the value that has been provided to the item from the instance that it belongs to. And you'd think, well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. If you're, if you're gonna catalog things anyways, why would you not just simply uh, change the instance to, uh, to reflect the, the, the changes you wanna have appear in the item? Well, this relates again back to the, uh, the notion that if you're doing referential cataloging, you may not have control of the uh, specific description of the instance. It may be something that exists outside in an external knowledge base and you depend on that knowledge base to update it and provide you with those things. I mean, that is kind of the whole point, but uh, sometimes they're not up to date right away and you need to provide some overrides at your level. This, this provides the library with some uh, measure of control of what appears at the item level. And because this is essentially an overlay concept, when that is updated in the knowledge base externally, you can then simply uh, revert your changes back and simply uh, expose the updated values from the external source. Thanks, Vince. Um, and and again, oh, sorry. Because right? is selected essentially is, is the same notion that we described uh, just prior in the instance level. And it does represent exactly the same thing in this case. It, it certainly applies more to the notion of uh, electronic resources than it would say physical resources, but it is simply uh, a measure by which you can select at the level of the item that uh, this is something being held by the institution. Uh, this may uh, override or complement what is defined at the package level. Thanks. Um, then next is item status, which again would be used just to indicate the status of the item, surprisingly enough. So on order, checked out, those kind of things. Um, location, package, and then rights would also be associated with their, our item or holding metadata. Coverage metadata, this is a pretty much um, just to indicate the library's holdings. So again, some fields that might be more applicable to electronic resources such as embargo, but then range, um, this could be used in either a very granular, like a single volume level. So we're intending coverage to be used um, as, as a container for any kind of descriptive holdings information, regardless of how finely grained you want it. At the volume level, at the a journal run level, where the range begins is 1997 to range in 2011, however you want to specify your range is, will fit in this container. Statement as a free form text field to just allow for additional notes or explanations regarding the coverage. Location metadata, uh, again, intending to allow for very broad or granular um, location identification, uh, depending on the needs of the institution. So institution, campus, library, and then parking, which is a general um, extensible name value pair that can be customized by the institution depending on their needs. Um, I show an example where the, we have a name of LC call number and then the value of the call number, but it could also be something like the name is shelf location and the value is reference. So again, depending on the needs of the institution. And then for electronic resources, the platform information and then URI to link out to the actual item. So those are the five data objects that we've had conversations uh, in depth about so far. And as you might have heard from my discussion, some of these are th the conversation is still ongoing and what is in those elements and what um, 
is in each of those objects is, is still being discussed. Um, and those conversations are happening on the discuss channel that um, Peter mentioned earlier. Also the metadata management SIG at its meetings has been discussing these and you're welcome to come over to and look at the page on the wiki, check out past recordings of um, meetings or come and attend any of our meetings if you have um, anything or want to add, add to that conversation. And there's also documentation at the Folio Codex Working Group also on the wiki. And I wanna just thank Peter and the Folio Forum facilitators for asking me to come and talk about this and I'll turn it back over to Peter. I'm gonna stop sharing now, so here we go. Great. All well, right. uh, thank you to uh, you and uh, to Kristen for uh, giving that uh, first overview of uh, what's in the, the Folio Codex. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, bring in uh, Sebastian and Vince. Um, I don't see Ian on the call, so uh, if he joins, uh, we will add him in. Uh, but I, I wanted to start out uh, with a, a kind of a, a basic question. Uh, you know, I, I, I think of the, the codex as, as uh, one of the new revolutionary things uh, that Folio is doing. Uh, you know, put that alongside all the other revolutionary things that Folio is doing, like uh, thinking about uh, micro applications and, and workflows. Uh, and a, a user experience first design using some prototyping tools. Um, what is uh, your interest in folio in, in the, the folio codex? What what uh, is is kind of the hook that really gets uh, you excited? Uh, Kristen, maybe start with you. Sure. Um, so, I guess I would say well. Part of it is because my background is as a serials and e-resources librarian, and I've worked with a lot of e-resource management systems, a lot of ERMs, um, with ILS, and I think the biggest problem with all those systems is that they don't work. And so you end up managing your resources in a lot of different places, doing a lot of duplicate labor, which I think if Folio can start to solve that problem, I would be extremely excited. And I think the Codex is a good step in this direction because um, what, you know, what I would really love to see is a system that truly understands e-resources, how they're modeled, and allows that model to be used across the whole Folio system. So an example that I give a lot, you know, when thinking about a traditional ILS is that my library, so we have a subscription to the journal Serials Review. And we have two bib records for Serials Review, a print and an electronic bib record. But that only tells a small part of the story when it comes to the electronic side, because we have a current subscription to Serials Review, um, and that's through Taylor and Francis. They're the current publisher of the journal. We used to have a current subscription through Elsevier back when they used to publish Serials Review, and we still have access to some of that content through Elsevier. Mm. We also purchased an Elsevier back file of Serials Review once, probably like 10 years ago, and we still have that. Um, it's also part of EBSCO host Academic Search Premier. So there's a lot of different ways we get this content, but in an ILS, all we can say is we have the eJournal Serials Review. And so what we, what I would love to be able to do is to really have something in my core library system that describes each one of those versions of this journal that lets me say, if I'm creating a PO that says I paid $100 for Serials Review, I know I paid $100 to Taylor and Francis for my current subscription. I know that I paid $500 10 years ago for the back file, and I can make those linkages across the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the codex is a good first step to achieving that, because if the codex allows pulling in of knowledge base type information, a knowledge base is really where you get those kinds of really useful serials and e-resources descriptions already. Being able to pull that in, create codex records, and have the other modules of Folio interact with the codex is what I'm excited about. And that's what I think um, a truly modern library management system should do. Great, great. Thanks. Uh, Lynn? Um, yeah, I, 
I'm not a serial librarian. I come from monographs world, but I mean, we are increasingly dealing with ebook packages that act in some ways very like um, e serials packages. There's um, multiple vendors, the same ebook available on multiple platforms, and sometimes we've um, purchased it on one platform, but we've also purchased it on another platform because we needed multi-user access. That was. So I think being able to have sort of all of those threads pulled together in one place where we can actually see what we've paid for when and what we're supposed to have access to uh, all in one place rather than sort of right now we have a bunch of disparate systems and I'm new to my job, so I'm still like learning where <laughs> to find the information that I need mm. to know about a particular package or a particular title even. Um, so I think there's a lot of promise in being able to pull these all together into one place where we can hopefully make some coherence out of what feels, at least to me right now, a little bit uh, incoherent uh, information landscape in terms of managing these resources. Yeah, great. Uh, Vince, what's your hook? Uh, what, what's getting you excited about the codex? Sure. So I, I'm, I'm not a librarian, so I, I approach this from the technology side. But mm -hmm. um, what I do, you know, thinking as an engineer by training, I, I see a big problem that needs the solution. So I'm excited to be able to provide that solution, contribute to it in the sense that we have a big problem. And if we can break it up into smaller problems, and deal with them separately, which is really what Folio as a platform is all about. It's about taking the, the big solutions that exist today and, and approaching it instead through the use of small solutions. And mm -hmm. Codex is that, is that connection piece that allows you to, to relate them all together and have uh, at least at the resource level and have the ability to, to interact with these things across the board. So while at the same time it lets you uh, break things into smaller pieces, it also lets you operate with all the small pieces on an equal basis. So Codex is the, is the unification factor in a way to the platform that allows it to be a, a platform. And still remain sane, trying to make that happen. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Sebastian, what's uh, your hook uh, to the Codex? Um, so I think I came at it initially from a perspective that there's been a, a, a long process, especially early on in Folio, of, of trying to figure out what we mean by platform. It's, it's, a, it's a really overused term. And in Folio in particular, uh, we were really looking to try to come at traditional library management workflows from a new perspective and one that was inspired by things like operating systems, like smartphones, like web application platforms. So environments that could do a lot of things that were not restricted by the initial set of requirements. And the one of the sort of, and it, it is really exciting to see that sort of unfolding in real life now that we actually are seeing apps unfolding and coming together on, on Folio, which you know, we didn't have early on. But one of the sort of key moving parts of that platform and, and what anchors it in, in, in libraries are the internal data models and foundational services that we put together to make up the space that apps work in. Um, and some of those models are, are, are fairly simple but important, things like like users and patrons, things like financial records. And, and I think by far the most challenging and interesting ones of the bunch is, is the codex, which represents, as Vince says, the resources that we're managing in the system. And, and I think that the hook for me, the thing that's particularly interesting about the codex is that in addition to supporting workflows in the library, the codex is a lot about the space between libraries and between libraries and vendors, supply chain, utilities like union catalogs. And, and that space between those players is changing really fast right now. And it's not really clear where it's gonna end up. And I'm thinking here of sort of partly the move from print resources to e-resources and what that means in terms of where metadata comes from and who, who curates it, but also moves like the move away from Mark and towards um, uh, linked data models or other types of representations. And for me, 
the the codex is a lot about trying to take a step back from all of those developments and squinting real hard and, and saying what can we do here that would let us build apps today within that space of resource management but also have those sort of apps and have a whole approach in folio move through time um one of my real hopes is that folio becomes a platform where we can we can take advantage of some of the affordances and benefits of linked data and perhaps also contribute to the direction of linked data and libraries and and the evolution and the role that bitframe is going to play in libraries which is going to be different than the role that mark plays just because of the nature of the underlying technology um and so so, so folio becomes a place because of the, fo the the codex where where we can explore some of those ideas it's not going to be able to do all things for all people for all purposes but it takes i think a a, a pretty clever subset of requirements and maps them out in a way that I hope will give us a lot of degrees of freedom. So in some ways, I'm more excited by the things we can do with the Codex two years from now than the things that we're gonna be doing over the next year. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it provides us a lot of freedom and that's that excites me a lot. Great, um, just pause here for a moment and again, encourage people to use the Q&A box uh, to uh, ask questions, uh, and as you ask questions in that Q&A box, uh, please uh, remember to indicate uh, if you've got a uh, microphone and, and uh, can ask your question directly. Uh, Michael Roberts uh, asked a couple of questions uh, early on. Uh, one is, uh, is KBART uh, a format that is uh, planned for support? Uh, mentioned a lot of acronyms uh, in there, and and uh, he was wondering about KBART. Do you have any specific thoughts on it, Vince? I've, well, I've got yeah. some, but I think know. that for the most part, uh, Folio and, and Codex don't really exclude any particular type of format, and it's just a matter of prioritization as to which ones we get to first. Now, the KBART structure itself would be not directly consumable by, by Codex, but it would be something that may get pulled into say inventory. And I know the knowledge bases will consume them as well to represent things in their world. So indirectly, in a way we already have support, but uh, when it comes to bringing stuff into inventory, we're gonna support a number of, of formats. That's kind of the whole point of being agnostic. And um, you know, we, we're obviously we're focusing on Mark because it's important initially. We've talked about uh, Dublin Core being a priority as well. Uh, down the road, we do see Bibframe being part of that, and I perfectly imagine that that um, uh, KBart would be one too. And and because this is an open community type of project, there is nothing to stop anybody to who feels the need to. I really, really need to have this KBart support in the inventory and expose and codex afterwards to go ahead and, and contribute and participate and accelerate the parts they think are important. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. And I can add a little to that too, because I'm also on the KBAR steering committee. Um, I mean, I think Vince's point that indirectly, you know, if KBART is going to a knowledge base, knowledge base data coming to Folio, you kind of get that. And I think there may be questions to be sorted out too, you know, depending on which external systems you're interacting with, do you, want that data going into your external knowledge base and into folio like how do you sort out what is your your primary location so i i sort of am interested in the idea and actually be curious to know what um the question askers use cases are for that um but at, before we do that the other thing i'll add is that one of the things that the kbart group is working on right now is um we've are in the process of launching a working group to be doing some enhancements to KBART. And one of them is creating um, a more complex structure for KBART using um, possibly JSON to create more of um, like a nested structure rather than just like a row based spreadsheet that would help make the description easier and help make using KBAR as a transmission format a lot easier. And then with the ultimate goal being that, you know, your publisher could use that format to communicate your institution's customized list of holdings directly to 
a vendor, be it Folio, being a knowledge base provider. And so rather than me having to go in and say like, activate, activate, activate all these different titles, I'd be able to get a file that sort of already knows what I have access to and that activates that automatically. And so that could um, present some really interesting opportunities for Folio as well. Um, but uh, if there are specific, um, specific feedback about interest in KBAR and why it might be useful to have it interact with Folio, I'd be really interested to hear that. Yeah, me too. That would be very cool. It's, it's a shame that Ian didn't make it. Um, so Ian is with Knowledge Integration and has done development work on, on GoKB. One of his side experiments, I know, has been to build some of the GoKB infrastructure into Folio as an experiment. So, and, and it's kind of neat the way that Folio challenges assumptions about what sorts of things live or is maintained where. Um, as you push things around in the cloud, it could potentially live in, in lots of different places. So I, I think it's a really, it's a fascinating question and I'd love to hear the use cases too. And, and uh, on a back channel here, uh, I did hear from uh, Ian earlier today that he wasn't feeling great and he was hoping to still join and uh, yet the, the worst case has uh, uh, come to fruition and, and he wasn't well enough to join us. So. Uh, uh, sending our our, uh, our best wishes to to Ian to uh, get better soon. Uh, Michael uh, added in chat here: uh, the use case for KBARD is coming from a publisher perspective. I'm looking for ways of helping our subscribers to get their library management system set up more easily. It's a standard format we're looking to push out anyway, uh, so it seems sensible to have support. Uh, I appreciate that it's there by proxy. Uh, sounds like, I, I don't know if there's other reactions to that, but uh, I would encourage uh, you, Michael, to uh, uh, put, uh, kind of expand your thoughts uh, on uh, discuss.folio.org. Uh, we're, we're interested uh, to hear from that publisher perspective of, of new integrations with uh, library management systems. I think the better publishers get at publishing on pushing out strong and, and, and clean KBOT data. This opens up all kinds of options for libraries and for vendors and software developers. Uh, another question that uh, Michael asked earlier is what happens if the uh, referential data is used uh, but the underlying record changes? Uh, does it uh, auto update? Uh, Kristen, I think this was referring back to uh, your part of the presentation. Yeah, um, I guess in terms of, you know, actual implementation, that might be a question for Vince, I, but from a functional perspective, I think we very much like it to auto update. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it definitely does. I, I think um, the, the question was uh, a little ambiguous, I guess, maybe, but in terms of referential cataloging, uh, definitely the whole point of, of keeping it uh, outside is that it'll be maintained by others, it'll be kept up to date, and you want to uh, reflect those changes automatically within the codex. On the inventory side, where you maybe more have those individual records, the, the same process will be, will be put in place. And, and you saw in the diagram that Lynn put up initially in her presentation, there is a reference being made to what's in inventory. And we have a connection back to the source record but uh, we do expect that the codex will be automatically updated. The big question is going to be, of course, the timing of that. And, and depending on how naive or sophisticated the connection to the, the, the source of the, of the record is, you can imagine it either has to be a, a periodic check or if we get clever down the way and this becomes a commonly supported thing or commonly done thing, then you'll expect to see technologies like resource sync and so on that would let us push changes much faster or even live. Correct. Correct. And, and the problem exists uh, not just simply from the point of view of synchronizing codecs to inventory records, but one of the use cases that Lynn mentioned was if you uh, put in an order in acquisitions, you have a workflow there that when you press that order button, you expect that you're going to push a record into inventory to present that and then it would also be picked up by Codex at that point. So that uh, from the Codex perspective, you have the ability to say, I'm looking for this title, do I have it? It'll tell you, well, you don't have it, but it's on order and here it is. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and another thing I'll add to that too is just that I think this auto updating actually provides a lot of opportunity for features that could be really nice in terms of, you know, if you have an external knowledge base that's updating, it might update things that you didn't even know about and could bring things to your attention that you need to deal with. So if, you know, I have a title, it's part of a certain package and suddenly it's not anymore or the coverage dates got closed out, that might tell me, oh, this is transferring to another publisher and I need to do something about that. So um, this is getting a little beyond, you know, what we've actually talked about implementing, but I think there's real potential there for like um, a notification service that could alert you to important changes about your resources and help you manage them. One of the interesting uh, possibilities that you get from having a, an interface, an abstraction like the codex within Folio is the ability to, to not just write apps on top of it, but also to do things behind that abstraction. And, and there is a level that you could take uh, sort of the idea of referential, you could take the idea of referential cataloging in the sense a step further and say that my entire sort of implementation of my codex would be, let's say for the sake of argument, WorldCat. So if you run a library where you, for your print monographs, like to keep everything in sync with, with, with WorldCat, and maybe you do your original cataloging in there, um, it would be fairly straightforward to have an implementation of the codex that's a more or less direct pass-through to uh, the WorldCat APIs, and you basically manage your bibliographic data, and possibly even down the road, your holdings um, that way in a shared system. So you avoid, you avoid some of these, uh, you know, there's a lot of workflows today in libraries that are batch copies of data from union catalogs to union catalogs, from institutional repositories or to them or synchronizing with parts of your electronic knowledge base and so on. But I'm, we're hoping that we can, with time and boys, and, and, and find much smarter solutions for using um, infrastructure built around the codex. Yeah, just to build on a little bit about what Sebastian was saying, I, I agree. I mean, the, so much of monographic workflow now is copy cataloging and batch importing and to be able to sort of allow that um, reproducing records locally to allow that to fall by the wayside but still I mean there is still the option to customize a layer if needed so that there is sort of that that intermediary layer but that as records are updated say in OCLC or knowledge base that those those updates are reflected in your catalog without any intervention from you, I think is, is a real benefit. I think the whole, the term referential cataloging or cataloging by reference really arose because we're sitting around being frustrated by all of the, the whole notion of copy cataloging and, and, and then sort of batch sharing your changes and updates and hoping that all the identifiers match up and stuff just, just felt just felt very arcane in the sense and felt like something that should be, you should be able to do better. And I'd say for that piece, part of that had also come out of the thinking about what it would mean to do BitFrame and, and not just looking at BitFrame as another, you know, a, a clunkier format to replace Mark with, but really looking at how that might change the way that the whole sort of ecosystem between libraries and utilities works. And BitFrame, to me at least, really suggests that we want to get to a place where sort of authoritative or trusted representations of instances and works and people and subjects are maintained by people out there, by someone else, and that we want to have systems in the library that's able to reference them and point to them and make use of them within the library without having to copy stuff down uh, and lose the relationship to the, to the source. Uh, and that's that's a big piece of what makes the idea of referential cataloging interesting for me. Well, so let's talk about BibFrame here for a moment. Um, is there a conceptual tension uh, between the the records based focus of the of the Folio Codex uh, and the graph focus of of library linked data in in BibFrame? Uh, how can graphs of library linked data be used in Folio? So I think there's a massive conceptual tension within a lot of communities that talk about library linked data. That's, that's been my impression from, from the conversations I've sat in on. It was, there was, we, we came very close to a, a, a call for a show of hands at the last LD4L and LD4P workshop where 
somebody said, you know, forget about the records. The records are, are so last year. It's all about the graphs. And somebody from the BibFrame project held up a hand and said, you know, well, no. Um, so I, I, so I, I'd been thinking about this from from a different perspective, and also kind of thinking about the relationship between uh, sort of RDF type uh, interpretations of the bibliographic universe and more record oriented ones. Um, Karen Coyle wrote in a paper, I, I think a couple of years back, a, a, a very interesting line that struck me that that said the whole notion of of, of these models, these entity models, whether it's 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 the one coming out of Verbo or the one coming out of, of Bitframe, in some sense you can see them as views into a larger reality. You know, so so the, the, the fact that I see uh, uh, an entity here, an instance or a work or something, and somebody else sees a, a graph or something, I just I, I I choose to have a view into that larger graph, and that's essentially what 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 Ferber or what what Bitframe does, I think that's a valid point of view. I also think that w when we we were debating early on in Folio whether we should kind of take the plunge and make it entirely graph oriented, uh, just free fall, you know, put a sparkle engine at the bottom and just kind of go at it. And apart from the the the, the performance concerns. Uh, that you have with Sparkle systems these days, and just the, the the issues that you run into with modeling, it it really felt to me that libraries are fundamentally entity oriented. They think in terms of instances, they think in terms of items, they think less in terms of graphs, and moreover, they really care about the provenance and the authority, the source of truth of something, and and in thinking about how you might take sort of a, a bib frame or an open link data universe and expose it within a system if you stick it all into a, a triple store it becomes very tricky actually to maintain that that provenance uh, uh that source information so to me the the codex feels like a technology or an approach that can provide a view into a linked data universe it it is a somewhat focused view that that really thinks about instances and works and items in order to support some core apps it's not going to be the end of everything that you might do with folio in the future but it meets the needs of those core workflows and it really does feel to me that for for at least the next 5 10 15 years libraries will still think in in entities more than they will think in graphs. When I think about sort of the culture and how we think about curating metadata and sharing and exchanging metadata, that that, that just makes a certain sense to me. Um, but I would also add then, one of the ideas behind Folio is, is that co the codex is not the final answer to how bibliographic metadata is to be viewed or worked with within Folio. Uh, Foley, the codex and, and, and the other data models that I mentioned earlier are replaceable. They are, are designed so that they can evolve over time. They are versioned into faces in a sense, and they are replaceable. So there's nothing stopping somebody from building a different bibliographic reference model within Folio and building a set of apps on top of that, or even having sort of a, a clue or boundary layer in between those two. So, so there's a lot of flexibility, but the codex feels like it's it addresses sort of where libraries are and, and where where they seem likely to go over the next few years while recognizing that the larger picture is totally out of focus and, and nobody really knows what it means to be moving to Bitframe right now. The Library Congress, OCLC, they don't know. They're still yeah. just playing around. I, I remember the conversations you referred to early on about how we could make this more of a bid frame implementation. I have more of a, of a sparkle implementation underneath, but part of the conclusion was what you just mentioned a minute ago, which is that these things are still in flux. They're not really fully accepted. They're not really fully thought out. Yep. I don't feel quite so pessimistic about, you know, how, what the lifespan of what we're putting together now is going to be. I, I would like to hope that it's going to be good for at least the, the good 10 years in the future, but I also don't see a tension with, um, with BibFrame, for example. No. Uh, the BibFrame is, is a conceptual model. We borrowed a lot of the concepts from that into uh, the codex model that we have. And uh, even when you look at something like a triple store, 
uh, in that type of model, you, you were defining graphs, but what is a graph? It's really just about nodes. And what are your nodes? Your nodes are records. So we are implementing the records part. We're implementing the nodes right now. You saw in the diagrams earlier that we, we have this idea, this notion that there's a work that's going to come together. And it, you know, just to expand on that a bit, we're thinking not just simply purely a work in the traditional bibliographic sense that's being referred to oftentimes by Bibframe, but more generally, I'd say uh, maybe we'll rename it by then, but it's sort of a it's that relationship, it's the missing part of the graph. It's the, the relationship between entities that will maintain it at that level. And once you have that, then you, you really do have the ability to reflect fairly well everything that you might find in a graph database. It's true. And I think, I think one thing in particular that we borrow, uh, one thing we borrow from, from BibFrame in particular that I think is important is the, the basic the basic idea of the entities and their relationships. So the choice of using works and instances rather than works and uh, rather than WEMI, what is it, works, expressions and manifestations is, is from my perspective at least, a, a pragmatic and a, and, a, and, a, and a smart choice because we can relatively, I, I feel like the, the work instance model of BitFrame is a really nice transitional model. You know, you can take a set of mock records, you can map them to a bib frame, and boom, you've got a set of, of instances. And and later on, as you you can develop algorithms, or you can manually start to combine them together into uh, to uh, to works. And when 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 other other sort of entities out there, utilities, or library of congress, whatever, start to create uh, uh, authorities for works, we can link to those. Uh, but it's it's a pragmatic model. Um, I think it might, you know, exist for a long time. I, I, you know, but but again, there might also be other models, and I just want to keep that open. I know that some folks have been frustrated a little bit with some of the folks who think in terms of graphs and triple store. I think feel that the codex model may seem too restrictive because they would like to, um, to, uh, to, to, to kind of throw a wider span of different possible applications against them. One of the ones that have been brought up uh, in that context is, is EAD, the, the archiving format, which is interesting because the, the, the record format or the document format can essentially contain an entire uh, multiple level hierarchically nested mm -hmm. uh, collection. How does that map into something like this? You'd have to make choices when you do the mapping. It's not a natural fit. Um, again, it, 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 with any exercise like this, you have to make some choices. You have to make compromises. And, and so far, I've, I, I feel really good about the compromises we've made in this particular area. Yeah, and, and I'll point out that you know we're not we're not strictly speaking uh, adhering to the to the big frame two model. That's the most recent. We have elements right. diverge. We interpret them slightly differently. And you mentioned the the problems in the archival space, right? Um, this is why we introduce a package notion in here because these are containers which can be used to represent some of these things. And um, I, I don't recall if, if Lynn emphasized the point early on, but this is, uh, this is a model that's gonna evolve. You know, we, 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 I think we're good right now that we're at a certain point where we have enough substance and enough stability in what's been presented so far that we can allow uh, development to, to happen against it. But in keeping with everything we do in the community here, uh, we'd like to keep the development as an iterative process rather than a waterfall process. And so this is the point where we have enough substance in the model. We can go ahead and start coding things. I'm, I'm certain we'll discover things, things that are missing, things that are needed, things we need to expand on. And we will probably best discover those when we, we get down to implementing actual applications, actual services that consume codecs. And we can then iterate on the model, improve it a bit. And, and uh, you know, maybe the, and is right at that point to start focusing on the work or the, the relationship object. Yep. One thing that's been interesting to me a little bit, which surprised me in, in, in the work with uh, the BitFrame model, is that uh, once we started digging into to, to holdings and physical holdings in particular, BitFrame doesn't really do much to address electronic holdings. But for physical holdings, we, we kind of expected that that'd be a good starting point because BitFrame de defines an, a physical item. Um, we found the, the model to be fairly fairly limited. Um, it, it had sort of a bit of a, a rough sketch uh, feel to it. And, and we actually contacted the Library of Congress and, and asked what was up with that. And 
and they basically said, well, that particular aspect of BitFrame had not really been addressed to any depth. Most of the people involved in, in the BitFrame standards work had been catalogers and, and, and not really acquisitions people or resource management people. So my suspicion is that there's going to be a pretty dynamic dialogue between uh, Folio and BibFrame where we are making some building a system here for the first time, which is fairly heavily inspired by BibFrame and looking to put to life some of the concepts that they developed. I think we're going to have a lot of opportunity to contribute back to the standards process um, and, and to be part of the dialogue around BibFrame as it comes together. Yeah, that will be good. Kristen and Lynn? To be honest, I'm not a cataloger, so I, I kind of feel like this is not my area. Maybe Lynn, you want to? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I think probably what I've said has been, I would be reiterating some of the things Sebastian and Vince said, but I, I do agree that I mean, I, the model that that is developed now is definitely has its feet in bib frame, and I don't really see the uh, or at least I'm not seeing the tension that Sebastian is seeing there. So I think that there's a, a good fit in, in terms of what the codex proposes for metadata elements and data objects. Um, or at least I don't think there's a, any kind of loggerhead moments, or I'm not seeing those. Maybe Sebastian can enlighten me on those, but, um, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I think my problem is I, I sometimes talk about this at conferences, and invariably there's going to be a sparkle person. There's going to be a triple store uh. person there, and they're going to yell at us, um, and they'll be mad because we, we, we haven't gone down that path. And, I, and also I remember early on uh, 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 somebody writing about another, it, it may have been either Koha or Kuali Ole writing that they had really failed to embrace the future by not using a triple store as the as the internal storage mechanism. So I, I, I get some of the okay. uh, people who have sort of doubts about whether we should have gone all in and, and, um, and is, is what we're doing representing kind of a watered down interpretation of the, of the potential of linked open data or library open data for that matter. Um, and I, well, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, but I mean, I think your, your point about we need to be pragmatic about this yeah. also has to be taken. And and I don't think, like you say, doing a whole, just a headfirst dive into creating triple stores is going to uh, serve us well in terms of act people being able to actually implement this and use this. And the, I, I would further say that there's nothing about the current data model and the objects that precludes anybody from deriving triples, you know, developing triple stores nope. out of that. So it could be, you know, that at some point we layer or underpin um, triple stores underneath this if needed. And I think you talked about earlier that there's, you know, there's the potential for we can ingest bib frame, true bib frame records, and then derive things out of those from the inventory to yep. support functionality. So I don't, Yes, we're not we're not doing a headlong dive into creating you know triple stores and that kind of thing, but I, I think we do need to be pragmatic and be realistic about where people are at in terms of what they could implement. Absolutely. And I do feel I, I I do feel really good about the compromise. I mean, it, this this is a compromise that's been a long time coming. It's it's taking a lot of thought and analysis and 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 really trying to figure out what what's the best way to represent what we need right now and and to support some experiments. And we've also had the notion that based on the Folio platform, it would not be difficult to make something within Folio that will replicate the whatever subset of, of the holdings metadata, of the resource management metadata mm -hmm. in a triple store. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to see people to be able to kind of do those experiments within Folio as well. And then Peter and I have had many conversations about, you know, when, when is the right time to take some of the interest in, in more in more aggressively linked data type approaches and, and, and start up a SIG, start up a conversation within Folio about what that looks like. So, so that's probably, if, if, if I seem like I'm, I'm sensitive to the tension, it's probably because of some of that. Right, but, well, and, and, and I think too that, you know, as you say, if we look a year out uh, and Folio is right. an actual viable, I mean, I think for people to be able to see actual working apps or 
some kind of right. something that uses linked data in a way that is truly useful to their workflow, then we've got something that, you know, it, that people can can point at and say, okay, this is this is where linked data is actually not, you know, sort of vaporware and pie in the sky. This is where it actually has utility for my data, the work of the library. And yeah. I, for me right now, that is where that is where the conflict is, is because I don't, there's right now, I don't have a thing where I could use linked data that does something I need it to do, you know, so that's, that, so, that's where, that's where I'm at. So if we can get there with Folio, oh, totally. that'd be great. <laughs> and so one, one, one of the things that, that I, I have thought a bunch about, and this part of the part of this is just conversations with, with the Library of Congress, because one of our, one of our side gigs at index data is to work with the Library of Congress on their bit frame two. Uh, conversion tables and conversion tools and, and all that stuff. We've, we've done a variety of sort of con gradually more complex experiments with them to help prove bit frame two and to help create experiments. And one of the, one of the kind of dream apps, one of the killer apps is going to be a cataloging interface that really takes advantage of mm -hmm. what linked data will give you. That isn't just, you know, uh that isn't just a clunkier way to do the kind of cataloging we've always done but something that makes it easy to find related entities and create links between things yep. recognize the larger structure that will be just really really fun to do um so so that's one thing that we we could perhaps hope to sort of stimulate mm -hmm. or, or make happen uh in, in folio out beyond just the, the immediate need to get things rolling uh because i think that could be just so much fun that killer awesome. cataloging app yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i don't know why why it's 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 an odd thing to find attractive but there's just something about it um, <laughs> then to counter that and then the completely different you know side of things i mean i i i know that people in the bitframe community also struggle with you know mark has a, an incredibly long tradition and it has it has evolved somehow along the way it made a leap from being a a, an exchange format, you know, for magnetic tape of all things, to being an actual cataloging meta language in a sense, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and so to to really make a a, a leap from a mock centric model to a bit frame model really is probably a leap to something that's much more mediated than what catalogers are used to, yeah. and I know some people have worries about whether the community will accept that. You know, how would they feel about that? We're touching on some aspects here, really, which uh, were mentioned just briefly in some of the presentations early on, which is that um, most of what we're talking about here is, is, is very much introverted. It's about how the library can pull in its records, manage its own little space. But the whole other promise that, that Folio and Codex in particular offer is the, the extroverted side of things. And in a yeah. way, this is the, the beginning of the social networking of libraries uh, catalogs in a way, and, you know, we mentioned union catalogs and such. And if we have a, a number of uh, institutions that are operating with a folio, uh, the, the codex is described as being a normalization layer, normalization in the sense that it's a standardized layer that everybody will, will speak the same language. This offers many possibilities in terms of combining uh, making uh, community spaces where resources are shared and offered up and and you can then not only just have this notion of referential cataloging to your own catalog, but you could make references to someone else's catalog. That's right. You have the uh, sides as a group of library to share, create one shared space. Right. So absolutely true. So there's, there's some, the, 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 the Codex allows us to do some short term things that we need to do just to have you know, a viable library management system. But, but it's really, it, it, it enables a whole bunch of different degrees of freedom and, and things that we can pursue along all these different avenues. And that's, that's what's really exciting about it in a way. So we think that the concept, if not the technical implementation of the Codex is something that might see a life beyond Folio. So it's a good question. I mean, I, I see no reason why not. Uh, to, to my mind, the, 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 the process that we've used to pursue the, the, the codex and the way we see it as, as being an abstraction layer more than any particular implementation 
would seem to lend itself very well to um, to, uh, to 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 be shared as a standard um, and potentially to have a life as as a set of tools that could have a life outside of Folio and could perhaps enable other systems to uh, to interoperate with Folio in this way. So we know that well, that there's, there's there's a good dialogue between the Folio community and with NISO and a lot of, of a recognition that Folio might be a, a kind of a, a incubator, if you will, for, 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 for new standards that kind of push the boundaries of what's been done before. Because we essentially Folio internally is seen or thought, we, we think of it as a, a space or community where developers can write these apps in relative isolation from each other, but with these shared interfaces as the lingua franca or the, 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 the interface, the points of, 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 of interaction. Mm -hmm. And if we can take some of those points of interaction and push them out and, and essentially propose them as, as models for other people to follow, then, then I think that that benefits everybody, the, mm -hmm. whole, the whole library community. Yeah, I'll point out the irony of the situation in that you described a minute ago how Mark started out as Union Change format essentially, and it then became a big graphic standard. So we're talking about Codex here, which is essentially a, a form of big graphic presentation, and yet it's going to become an exchange format as we yep. start moving things. Mm. Absolutely. Some lessons to be learned there, perhaps, or at least uh, <laughs> things not to be repeated. Well, it's come full circle, we're going the other way. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I'm going to uh, pause here. We've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, I do want to see uh, if there are any other uh, questions from uh, the, uh, the members of, uh, of the audience. Uh, so feel free to uh, put those in uh, the uh, the question and answer box. Um, we t I, I just want to ask this one, and and you know feel free to uh, uh, say that uh, uh, you know you're off on the wrong track, or or you're, you're thinking about this in the wrong way. Uh, and, and that we're talking about uh, high level abstractions and, and interchange layers. Uh, and that starts to sound a lot like uh, Dublin Core. Uh, so is the Folio Codex the same as Dublin Core? Uh, in what uh, uh, important ways are they different? So in, in terms of um, in parallels, you know, we have, we have a, a data model that is inspired in terms of the objects that it has from DibFrame. We have a very high degree of inspiration uh, for the metadata fields themselves. The, the models that Lynn was going through were very heavily inspired by Dublin Core. And, um, and for the most part, they are, they are kind of the same. There's some additional things that we've added on to that to, to accommodate some of the special needs we might anticipate in bringing together uh, resources that are completely different in terms of their origin, be electronic or print and, and so forth. And at the same time, uh, shifting things around a little bit in, to accommodate that conceptual model where we have introduced the notion of an instance and an item. And so some things you might find in the Devon core description might be found in the item level, or they might be found on location level, they may be found in the, uh, in the instance level. But for the most part, uh, you know, Dublin Core set out with a mission to describe resources in a generic fashion, which is kind of what we're doing here. Uh, Dublin Core went a little further in the sense that they then uh, explored the ability to, to describe things in a, in a richer way than we're interested in, because Folio is really about providing the minimal set of information that can be uh, used commonly by everybody else. So in, in designing this model, in, in this, this unification element, which is codex, there's two ways to approach it really. You can say, I can make a really rich model that accommodates the needs of every possible resource that I can anticipate. And this is kind of like the union approach. Or you could take another approach to say, well, let's just delegate. And again, this is keeping to the microservices approach, the responsibility of that richness of description to specialized areas like inventory mm -hmm. or acquisitions mm -hmm. or circulation. And then focus on, the intersection of all these things, what are the things that 
they can all provide in common? What are the things that are needed to, to uniquely identify and distinguish resources and yet still get back to the rich description that exists in another space? And that's the approach we took, which is sort of a intersection sort of uh, approach to it. I wonder if it might, there might be an interesting exercise at some point to look at whether the, the additional data elements that the codex has that really are specific to the operation of a, of a library as a resource management might be something that could be fed back into uh, to the Dublin Core community. So imagine a, a flavor of Dublin Core or a set of extensions uh, specifically focused on, on resource management, essentially. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really interesting idea because I think one of the, the big problems from an acquisition and resource management and e-resource perspective is that there is a lack of any standards for that kind of data. And so, I mean, I know we've had situations where, you know, we're thinking about, okay, we use this product from one vendor, we'd love to use this product from a different vendor, but we can't because there's no way to share data between them and we don't want to manage that data twice. Yep. And so anything that could help with you know, being able to say, here are our holdings, and we could send these out to a variety of different people. They can all understand this format. We can do it once and then operate with different systems. It would be great. And I think it gets back to the talk of a standard, you know, having a standard that actually says, this is how you describe not just a journal, but this is how I describe a journal from a certain provider on a certain platform would be awesome. So I'm excited about anything related to that. Yeah, very true. So maybe what it really means is just that the, the Dublin Core uh, initiative is the more natural home for this than ISO. It could be, but you also have to remember that there are potential opportunities in Folio to establish multiple standards, especially if we start thinking about it in terms of isolating different domains of expertise and interest. In, and, and so Kristen just mentioned the acquisition domain it could be that there's a standard that comes out of that and another standard comes out of codex and maybe another standard, yet another standard comes out for circulation. So there, there are many opportunities here and, and we should not think of ourselves as limited to trying to identify one. Uh, oh, no, for sure. No, each, each one of the domains potentially becomes a, uh, has a standards track associated. Right, one or many. Yep. All right. Um, I don't see any more questions. And so I think uh, this wraps it up. Uh, this concludes uh, today's forum on the Folio Codex. Uh, it's been a great conversation. Uh, please continue the conversation on the Folio Discussion website. Uh, discuss oh, you, just got a, you just got a question. I'm sorry, Peter. Oh, I did? <laughs> oh, one just popped in. OK. Uh, would there be be a referential model for the authority file as well. That's a good question. Ah, authority yes. Authority questions. Yeah. So, I, I, other pe other people can chime in. I, I I think my expectation is that as we unfold the entities of um, subjects and people and and works, that will become the point at which we get. Um, sort of authorities mix into this model as well. And that's the right way to do it. That that will be my take, but I'm not I'm not being a catalog. I, I'm, I may be, be off base there, but that's how it's felt to me. And that, that makes sense. And that's the way I'm thinking about it too, which is, which is part of the reason why you had those elements shown in blue in the diagram, because we have to be pragmatic. We can't solve all the problems. And those are, are complex situations that need to have a good deal of thought to be addressed. But ultimately, yes, I think we do want to use the same notion of having a, a referential model for authorities. You don't want to be recreating those everywhere and it's to everybody's benefit. And maybe this is something that comes out of that, that community aspect of. of and I think my, my best sense is that the, the way that links linked data wants to go is away from the notion of authority files and over to, to, sort of uniquely identifying what someone is, who someone is by a link to, to, to an entity. Oh. And I know this is a, a personal interest of mine. Uh, I'm participating on uh, Cornell's uh, IMLS uh, sharing local authority 
uh, local name authority records and, and uh, that report is being put together now. So um, I too see there are parts of folio uh, that could be used as, as, a, uh, as a testing ground uh, and a development mm -hmm. ground for this kind of sharing of, of at least local name authority data. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Another thing I'd like to see when it comes to to approaching authority is seeing what the the UX the UX centric approach. And by this I mean the collaboration between our, our, our UX people, of which we at this point have quite a few in Folio, and and the special interest groups. So, mm -hmm. people logging experts, getting them down, getting them together with UX people to start to really think about what would what would really good uh, support for authority work look like in Folio. Yeah. yeah. And with the iterative approach, we would then have a, a loop down into the into the modeling of the data and the services we need to, for that. And exactly. Back up. Well, as I was saying, uh, it's it's the <laughs> bottom of the hour now, and and. Uh, thank you for asking that question, and and do let's uh, continue this discussion. Uh, on the folio uh, discuss.folio.org website uh, and also on Twitter uh, using the hashtag folio forum. Uh, the recording of today's forum will be posted soon to the openlibraryenvironment.org website. Uh, our next folio forum will be next month on the GoKB project. Uh, so watch that same website for more details and a link to the registration. Uh, it's not there now, but it'll be there soon. Uh, thank you to our panelists today, uh, Kristen, Lynn, uh, Vince, and Sebastian. Thank you, uh, thank you thank to you. Michael and Sharon for being my behind the scenes technical support. Uh, and uh, thank you to everyone who participated asking questions and, and adding comments. Uh, very